ready? Okay, we're here for systematic theology. You have assigned today quizzes 18 and 19. So I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, take two separate pieces of paper, one for each quiz, 18 and 19, and begin the verses for each right now, and I will give you about 10 minutes to get those verses complete. You may begin.
Okay, we're going to start with quiz number 18. Quiz number 18, question number one. Which person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit? Which number person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit? Which number person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit? Number three, what do we mean, what does the Bible mean by the deity of the Holy Spirit? What is meant by the deity of the Holy Spirit? What is meant by the deity of the Holy Spirit? Number three, list one divine attribute of the Holy Spirit. List one divine attribute of the Holy Spirit. One divine attribute of the Holy Spirit. Number four, list one of the works of God that the Holy Spirit fulfills. List one of the works of God that the Holy Spirit fulfills. One of the works of God that the Holy Spirit does. Number five. Please give me one way that the Holy Spirit is connected to the Father and the Son. Give me one way the Holy Spirit is connected to the Father and the Son. Number six, the Holy Spirit is identified with what Old Testament word for God? The Holy Spirit is identified with what Old Testament word for God? Number seven, in the account of Ananias and Sapphira, at first, one is told that they had lied to the Holy Ghost. That's in verse number three of Acts chapter five. And then in verse number four, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? Number eight, reinforcing the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 139 verse seven teaches, whither shall I go from thy blank? Please fill in the blank there. Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Whither shall I go from thy blank? 
or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Number nine is another fill in the blank. The Holy Spirit is the giver of life. Salvation is from the Father, through the Son, blank the Spirit. From the Father, through the Son, and blank the Spirit. From the Father, through the Son, and blank the Spirit. That's number nine. And number 10, the Holy Spirit is the one who anointed the promised who? The Holy Spirit is the one who anointed the promised who? And then if you would finalize your answers and put quiz 18 to the side, We'll begin quiz number 19. Quiz number 19. Number one, the work of the Holy Spirit. He was co-active with the Father in what account? What biblical account? Do we see the Holy Spirit being co-active with the Father? Number two, we see the work of the Holy Spirit in giving us the what? What has the Holy Spirit given us? What has the Holy Spirit given us? Number three, what does God the Holy Spirit do with those same things that he has given us? Those same things or that thing in number two, what does the Holy Spirit do with that thing? He's not just the giver of this thing, but he does what with it? That's number three. Number four, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit? Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit? Number five, what reality, what reality is essential for effective service? What reality in the life of a believer is essential for effective service? It's number five. Number six, we depend upon the Holy Spirit, not just for results, but rather for what? We depend on the Holy Spirit, not just for results, but rather what? It's 
number six. Number seven, what does the word reprove mean? What does the word reprove mean? What does the word reprove mean? Number eight, what word describes a heartfelt acknowledgement of one's lost condition before a thrice holy God? What word describes a heartfelt acknowledgement of one's true lost condition before a thrice holy God? It's number eight. Number nine, what is the unpardonable sin? According to your study, what is the unpardonable sin? And then number 10, as the believer yields to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces what type of fruit in that believer's life? As the believer yields to the Holy Spirit, he produces what type of fruit in that believer's life? Okay, if you could make that quiz number 18 and 19, send that over to me. We ended our study with the emblems of the Holy Spirit, and today we're going to pray and continue the study of the Holy Spirit with the work of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for the scriptures. I thank you for your word. I pray that you'd help my mind as I teach. I pray that you'd help us to better understand doctrine. Pray that we'd want to understand doctrine, that you would lead and guide in this study, that you'd be with each student and help them as they prepare uh, for not just this test coming up and not just to pass this class, but as they prepare for serving you wherever you may have them be. Help us, Lord, to be concerned today about sound doctrine. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at systematic theology. We're looking at the work of God, the Holy Spirit. What does he do? And we're going to organize this study um, as best we can, looking to God's word. First of all, we want to look in relation to the universe, the Holy Spirit's work in relation to the universe. What has God done? the Holy Spirit done 
in this universe? What has he worked? He is an active being. He does things. He has done things. He will continue to do things. What has he done in this universe? First, in regards to creation. What has the Holy Spirit done in regards to creation? Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. If you're not careful, you'll miss that. God, the Holy Spirit, active in creation. The Spirit of God, a person, a real person, the third person of the triune God, moved upon the face of the waters, active in creation. We see this in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. We see it in Job chapter 26. Let's go there as well. Job chapter 26. Verse number 13. Job 26, 13. Scripture. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. What has God used to garnish or to uh, decorate the heavens? His spirit, the Holy Spirit active in creation. Not just these two passages, but we see this uh, work of the Holy Spirit in relation to creation. Also in Job 27, verse number 3. Job 33, 4, Psalm 33, 6, Psalm 104, verse number 30, Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 12, 13, and 72. God, the Holy Spirit, uh, did not take a uh, passive state in creation. Very active, the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. And according to Job, garnished the heavens, the Holy Spirit. Number two, in relation to the universe, the Holy Spirit is currently active. Not just active in creation, but active now. Active right now as we speak. In the work of preservation. Currently active. He's doing something now. Look at Psalm chapter 104. Psalm chapter 104, Psalm chapter 104, verse number 29, thou hidest thy face, they are troubled, thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust, thou sendest forth thy spirit, that's present tense, Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created. and Thou renewest the face of the earth. He, just, he doesn't just create the earth. He didn't just create the earth. He keeps the earth. He preserves it. As I was driving today, um, just along Midway Plaisance here in Chicago, along the University of Chicago campus, and even as I was driving away from my parking space this morning, from home looking at the trees and um, we get so busy in life when we're little kids we we notice the trees budding and we know that spring is right around the corner and every year like clockwork those trees bud and the trees are budding now and it's beautiful but that is a reminder that the same God that created this world preserves it by his Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that moved upon the face of the waters makes the trees to bud today. He is currently active in relation to the universe. 
Secondly, I'd like us to see the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to Scripture. In relation to Scripture. And the first way we see the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to Scripture is by the work of inspiration. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word in the New Testament means God breathed. We're talking about the method by which God's words were given. Inspiration. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Inspiration, that uh, divine transmission of God's words to man. We see the work of the Holy Spirit in inspiration, inspiration of the scriptures in the Old Testament, first of all. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, the Old Testament. You say, but we're looking at a New Testament book. Let's look there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy, meaning the prophecy of the scripture, came not in old time by the will of man. Old time, what are we talking about? The Old Testament. In old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Ghost. Okay, again, these Holy men of God, how did they speak to give us the book of Isaiah? How did they speak to give us the book of Ruth? How did they speak to give us the book of Lamentations? How did they speak? Only as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. We see this in the Old Testament. We see it in 2 Samuel chapter 23, if you would go there. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 2. 2 Samuel 23, verse number 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. And his word was in my tongue. That's inspiration. The Spirit of the Lord, who? God, the Holy Spirit, speaking by a person. David is speaking here about himself. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. What a blessing. What a tremendous miracle we see here that the Spirit is speaking by a man and that his word, whose words, the Spirit's words were in his tongue. Old Testament inspiration. We see it in Micah chapter 3, verse number 8. Matthew 22, 43 and 44. Acts 4, verse number 25. The Holy Spirit working inspiration in regards to the Old Testament. Secondly, the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to Scripture with the New Testament, the New Testament, the same God, the Holy Spirit, that authored the Old Testament, also authored for us, and eternally, the New Testament. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse number 13. Jesus here now is speaking. To his disciples, John chapter 16, verse number 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now what had not been written yet? The New Testament. The Holy Spirit will guide you. 
talking to his apostles, talking to the disciples. He will guide you into all truth. What is truth? The scripture is truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The New Testament. We see this also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 16. Ephesians 1. 16, we're going to leave that one out for now. Inspiration. I would, I would mention another one, though. I will go to one that's not in our notes. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse number 15. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our brother, beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, talking about Paul and his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. I only have you turn to that passage for uh, the words in verse number 16, other scriptures, referring to Paul's writings being New Testament scriptures. Of course, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God and was given as the Holy Spirit bore along not only the Old Testament writers, but also the New Testament ones. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the universe, the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the scriptures, and then third, the work of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> in relation to unbelievers. What work does God the Holy Spirit do on the behalf of those who currently are, are unbelievers outside of his grace? The unsaved. Does the Holy Spirit just leave them off? First of all, the Holy Spirit strives with them. It is a sobering thing to realize that at one time I was lost in this world. I was uh, steeped in the darkness of my sin. I was dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Yet God sent his Holy Spirit to strive with me, to fight with me, to, to wrestle with me. In Genesis chapter 3, go there with me, God makes a statement in order to let us know that that striving has an end. In other words, God will strive so long before he's stops striving and you want to respond to God striving while he's striving when he stops working and wrestling for an individual soul that's a very dangerous position to be in in Genesis chapter 6 verse number 3 and the Lord said my spirit shall not always strive with man God's Holy Spirit won't always fight the unbeliever but he does. He strives with man. That's what he does. That's part of his work in relation to those that are not saved. He strives with them to win them unto himself. Secondly, the Holy Spirit restrains the unbeliever. The Holy Spirit restrains the unbeliever. By that we mean 
that he'll only let the unbeliever go so far. And it would seem that the lost have great license right now, the wickedness that we see, the homosexuality, the transgender. We, we say to ourselves, how worse could it get? It could get much worse if it weren't for the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit right now, saying to an unsaved man, you go this far, but you can go no further. We see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you'll look there with me. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse number 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, we're talking about a person, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That restraining influence that now letteth is referring to the Holy Spirit. He who now letteth. One day that restraining influence will be taken out of the world. It will happen at the rapture. Now think of that. The believers are... The Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells within us, God the Holy Spirit. When the rapture takes place and all the believers are taken out of this world, the restraining influence that was within you and I as believers will be taken out of this world. What do you think this world will be like when the Holy Spirit's taken out? Unrestrained evil. But right now, in relation to the unbeliever, the Holy Spirit has this work of restraint. Number three, he convicts. He convicts the unbeliever. I have seen people in the pew as I preach the gospel under heavy conviction. That was not me. That wasn't my words. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in regards to an unbeliever. It's him working on that unbeliever's heart, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I Go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit. What will he do? What will be his ministry? What will be his work? To convict. We see it in verse number 8. And when he is come, that's talking about a person. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's talking about... His work of convicting. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict. Convict. The word reprove is used in verse number 8. It literally means to bring to light. When the word of God is preached, when the gospel is preached, and people are under the realization of their sin, God, the Holy Spirit, brings to light what a person is to themselves, a condemned sinner. The Holy Spirit brings to light the things that they've done contrary to the law of God, such things that condemn them as sinners and convince them as sinners. The Holy Spirit does this ministry of convicting. According to this passage, convicting, first of all, of sin. The greatest sin that an unbeliever is guilty of is the sin of unbelief. They need to be brought to a saving knowledge of the Son of God through faith. Of sin, it says in verse number 9, because they believe not on me, the sin of unbelief. The Holy Spirit will convict and does convict the unbeliever of righteousness. Righteousness. Whose righteousness? Not our own because we don't have any. The Bible says, for there is none righteous, no, not one. But the Holy Spirit does convict the unsaved person of the righteousness of Christ. 
that he is the righteous one, the sinless one. Verse number 10, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. The righteousness of Christ who ascended back to his Father. Third, the Holy Spirit convicts of judgment. Judgment. The judgment of Satan. Verse number 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is Satan. And the Bible prophesies that he will be eternally judged. When Satan tries to remind you of, his, of your past, you need to remind him of his future. And his future is to be cast into the lake of fire, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Let's look, of, let's look at some examples of conviction in the book of Acts. Examples of people being convicted, and not just convicted, but convicted by the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, convicting these people. Look at Acts chapter 2. All of these are from the book of Acts. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse number 37. Acts chapter 2, verse number 37. Now when they heard this, heard what? The apostle Peter preaching. They were pricked in their heart. Now what does that mean, they were pricked in their heart? It means they were convicted. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles... Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2, Verse number 37, we see this convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Peter, it says, was full of the Holy Ghost. He was one of the apostles. Peter stood up and preached. But it says very plainly in verse number 4 of Acts chapter 2, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So when Peter preached, he preached full of the Holy Ghost. He preached full of the Holy Ghost. And the people that were lost were pricked in their heart. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Look at Acts chapter 8. We see Another instance of the Holy Spirit convicting. Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian eunuch, verse number 29. Acts 8, 29. The Bible says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. The Holy Spirit is speaking and telling him to go and to do this. Verse number 30, and Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man, of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. 
And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip, oh, caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Who convicted this Ethiopian eunuch? The very one that spoke to Philip and said, go join yourself to that chariot, was pe preaching through Philip, convicting the heart of this eunuch. And he was brought to Christ. Saul, Saul in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verse number 5. Next chapter, verse number 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul is told by the Lord Jesus Christ that he's kicking against the pricks. This is referring to Saul fighting conviction, kicking against the pricks, fighting the conviction of the Holy Spirit. See that there? We see it with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Conviction. Acts chapter 10, verse number 44. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Fell on them. They fell under deep conviction. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse number 25. Acts 16, 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. This man was convicted by the Holy Spirit as the earthquake took place. So convicted that he said, what do I have to do? He saw that Paul and Silas, they were there. They had not escaped from the prison. We're here. He would have lost his life. When he saw that, the Holy Spirit fell on him, fell under conviction. So convicted that he said, what do I need to do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? The jailer. We see this also with Felix in chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse number 24. And after certain days when Festus came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, there they are again, by the way. Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. 
when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Go thy way. He was trembling. Why? Convicted by the Holy Spirit. Agrippa, convicted of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verse number 23. Acts 26, 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What did Agrippa say? You've almost convinced me. I'm almost persuaded. Something that you are saying, something that I'm hearing from you is persuading me. And I'm almost ready to get saved. The Holy Spirit convicting him. This is part of the Holy Spirit's work today in relation to unbelievers. He convicts. Number four, he testifies and witnesses to the unbeliever. According to John chapter 15, verse number 26, and Acts 5, 30 through 32, he speaks to that unbeliever and testifies of Christ. Number five, he invites. The Spirit says, come, according to Revelation 22, Verse number 17, he invites the sinner to believe and be saved. Inviting. So we've looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the universe, in relation to the scripture, in relation to unbelievers. Now, capital letter D in my outline, the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit in relation to Jesus Christ. First of all, Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse number 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The conception of Christ. Second, the anointing of Christ. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Luke 4, 18, Jesus said this in reference to the prophecy of the book of Isaiah, Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm anointed, Jesus said, of the Holy Spirit. We see this also in Acts chapter 4, verse 27. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 9. Anointed of the Holy Spirit. Second, led of the Holy Spirit. According to Matthew 4, verse number 1. Jesus, led of the Holy Spirit. That is a divine example that you and I need to not make decisions
based upon our own understanding, leaning on our own understanding. So many do that to their, to their peril, to their destruction, making their calling the shots. Oh, no, we need to be led of the Holy Spirit and convinced that when we're to make a decision, especially on important matters, when we're led to make a decision that, that we can say that we've, that we've heard from heaven, not audibly, but in the sense that God the Holy Spirit has spoken to our heart and has said, this is the way, walk ye in it. Led of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He was led of the Holy Spirit, led even into temptation of the devil. What else? Jesus was filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse number 14. at a parallel passage of this in Luke. Let's go back to Luke. Chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, this is a parallel passage of the temptation of Christ. And it says in verse number 1 of Luke chapter 4 that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But after the temptation was over, the Bible says in verse number 14 that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. In other words, Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's work in relation to Christ is that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was also empowered by the Holy Spirit, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 14. He was resurrected by the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 1, verse number 4, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 11 of Romans, 1 Peter 3, 18, resurrected by the Holy Spirit. And number seven, in relation to Christ, the Holy Spirit, he gave commandments by the Holy Spirit, according to Acts chapter one. Let's look there. Acts chapter one, he gave commandments according to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter one, verse number one. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. He gave the commandments through the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at these uh, works of the Holy Spirit in relation to Jesus Christ, he was conceived, anointed, Led, filled in power, resurrected, and gave commandments through the Holy Spirit. Capital letter E, the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the church. In relation to the church. The Holy Spirit is very, very, very active as we look at all of these things. First of all, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the members. He gives gifts to the members. It's 
Second, he directs the missionaries of the church, calling out people from their assembly to go forth into the world and preach the gospel in the regions beyond. Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 13 Referring to Paul and Barnabas. Acts chapter 13, verse number 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, don't miss who's speaking in verse number 2. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me. And so the Holy Ghost directs the missionaries of the church. He calls and appoints its leaders, according to Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 20. The Holy Spirit warns the members of the church, rebukes them, and warns them, corrects them. According to 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's go there. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Verse number one, the Holy Spirit warns the church. We see this in 1 Timothy 4, verse number one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. The Spirit is speaking here. The Spirit is warning here. Warning the members. Number five, the Holy Spirit directs the leaders of the church. According to Acts chapter 15, verse number 28, the Holy Spirit directs the leaders. Let's look at Acts chapter 15. Verse number 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well, directing the leaders into sound doctrine saying this is what you ought to keep away from and tell the people to keep away from. The Holy Spirit also rewards each church. According to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 verse number 7, he that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit the Spirit saith unto the churches, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I'll reward this church that overcomes. And so the Holy Spirit is very active. Not was active. The Holy Spirit is, present tense, very active. We're going to continue and look at the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the believer. We've looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the unbeliever, in relation to Christ, in relation to the unbeliever, the, the scripture, the universe. Now we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to those that are saved. We'll start with number one, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. According to the Bible, the moment a person is saved, they are indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. They become a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, told the church at Corinth that they were indwelt. The believers were indwelt 
by the Spirit of God, the indwelling. This involves several things. Number one, we are sealed. Those of us that are saved are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with what? That Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed, marked, branded as his. Look at chapter 4, verse number 30, Ephesians 4, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Every born-again person is sealed by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 also teach it. Sealed denotes a few things. Number one, it denotes security. Security. When a person gets a piece of mail with their name on it, a piece of mail comes, it says, Courtney Lewis, that is registered to me. I'm the only one uh, legally that's allowed to open it. Only the sender, okay, if, if they were the sender and something was wrong, they could open it. Only the sender or the receiver can open it. It is registered. God is the sender. We are sealed. We are marked as his. And so this denotes security. Security. He owns us. We're under his authority. We are his responsibility. We are sealed. It also denotes not only security, but purity. Purity. Ephesians 4.30 says not to grieve the Holy Spirit by our not to grieve the Holy Spirit by our sin because we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. There should be a mark of purity. The context of this passage is lying, a lying tongue. Grieving the Holy Spirit shouldn't happen because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're going to stop there today at the sealing of the Holy Spirit and pick up. Again, there are several other things with, in the relation to the believer that the Holy Spirit does and is to us. But we're going to stop there for today. I'm sorry.